for whatever reason, nobody likes this mic, I guess. No one used it all day. They all went to that one. So I'll just move it out of the way. How's everybody doing today? That didn't sound so fantastic. I mean, I heard what you said, but it kind of sounded like not so fantastic. Like, fantastic's an exciting and encouraging, like a fabulous thing. And that was like, yeah, I'm fine. Fantastic. Come on, guys. Jesus rose from the grave. He came to save you and me. And he has the power and the ability to do so. How are you doing today? Amen. Very good. I want to go into a chapter today, continuing in our Bible reading, picking out some, some passages here to, to teach on. Uh, I want to go into a passage today, and it's really interesting. We're introduced to four characters in this passage, and three of them reflect characteristics of Christ, while one of them does not. So there's amazing, there's a juxtapose in this chapter, a, a, a contrast and comparison theme going on. And so we're going to look at that. Um, but before we do, let me tell you a quick story to kind of get us in the mood. Dominic's, Dominic Fats McCarthy was an Australian soldier who fought in Gallipoli and France from the beginning of World War I. And in August of 1918, McCarthy was commanding a company in northern France when the ba battalion to his left was flanked by the Germans. The Germans had, had fortified their position and had entrenched themselves with machine gun fire, and they had flanked this position and would not allow the, the forces to advance any further. Irritated that something was standing in the way of this storm, of, of his storm of Asbet, McCarthy took three other men with him to deal with this German trench that was causing so many problems. For a guy named Fats, McCarthy could really move. He outpaced the guys who came with him and managed to avoid the turrets of hot lead being spat at him from the German guns. He arrived at the first machine gun nest, blasted it into oblivion before the other guys could even catch up. Without pausing for breath, launched a one-man blitzkrieg of the entire German trench system armed only with a standard rifle and a few grenades. McCarthy captured five machine guns, killed 22 Germans, and captured 50 more. He secured half a kilometer of German trench by himself. The Germans were so impressed with his fighting that when they surrendered, they patted him on the back and told him what a good job he had done. That's a man of valor. That is a man of courage. That is a man of war who was determined to not let anything stand in his path of resistance. He was going to march through it and accomplish his mission. Open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 14. Open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel 14. There's a story in 1 Samuel 14 about a man who was determined to accomplish his purpose no matter what the cost. 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 1. 1 Samuel 14 verse 1. Now it came to pass, 1 Samuel 14, verse 1, upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul stayed in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which was in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahiatub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. Right off the beginning, we see a juxtapose between Jonathan and his father, the king, Saul. Right off the beginning, we see Jonathan, who's running off with his armor bearer, into a conflict all by himself, just those two, against an army that greatly outnumbers them, while his father sits underneath a pomegranate tree with 600 men waiting to see what God is going to do. Now, it's not that there isn't signs that God is already blessing this, because the Philistines greatly out, out, outnumber the Israelites, and yet, instead of coming down and attacking them as easy prey, Saul and his 600 men, they stay fortified up in their garrisons. So they can, or we can already see that God's hand is protecting Israel in this, and yet only two of the men are ready to go out 
to war. Now, this shouldn't surprise us that Saul finds himself hiding behind a pomegranate tree. Because if you read chapter 13, or if you read chapter 13, you can see that he has broken his covenant with God. He has been told that he is no longer going to be king and that God is going to leave him and use someone else to accomplish his purpose. It's interesting. When you're in harmony with God... you have holy boldness. When you're in harmony with God, you have confidence in His Word. When you're in harmony with God, you have confidence that He's willing to use you. When you have harmony with God, you have confidence that He is going to do what He says He is going to do. But contrasting to that, if you're not in harmony with God, the other phenomena is true. If we're not in harmony with God, we, like Saul, hide behind the tree while others go and do the work of the Lord. Saul didn't have confidence because he wasn't in harmony with God. He didn't believe God was going to bless him. He didn't believe God was going to use him. He didn't believe in God's word any longer because Saul had fallen out of favor with the Lord. Now, what surprises me most about this is that Saul and David both committed great sins when they were in kingship. But David found forgiveness and was able to be used by God to accomplish great for him while Saul was not. Why is that? That's right, because King David was a man after God's heart. He understood he was a sinner, and along the path you're going to make mistakes. And when he made those mistakes, he was willing to shed all of his pride and come back before the Lord and before the people in repentance and tears. But Saul was always trying to save face. Saul always wanted to maintain his image in front of the people as this lordly kingship, and it came back to destroy him. Have you fallen out of harmony with God? Have you lost confidence that God will use you? Have you lost confidence in the word of God and that God will bless you? If you have, do you want it back? If you've backslidden and you realize that, do you want to be in harmony with God and have this restored relationship and have confidence with him? Because God will restore You're going to have to turn back to him. You're going to have to repent. You're going to have to fully surrender to him. But if you do, God promises to restore. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Saul refused the appeals of God to return to him, and as a result, he could not be restored. Today, if you are hearing the appeals of God to come back to him and let him restore you to him and bring you back in complete harmony with him, hearken unto that voice, for he will restore you according to the Bible. He will elevate you and restore that confidence that you once had in him. The story gets even more interesting to me in verses 4 and 5. In verses 4 and 5, after we are met with this contrast and this this comparison between Saul and his son, and his son obviously being more fit to be the leader, in verse 5, we we carry on this story and learn more about this son, Jonathan. Um, I'm sorry, verses 4 and 5. And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistine garrisons, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sina. The forefront of the one was situated northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. Now, it's interesting, when you read this, the Bible is very clear. It doesn't even say there was rock on this side and rock on that side. It says sharp rock. Anybody here ever climbed mountains before? Anybody here ever went up a cliff before? Now, it's one thing to climb a cliff if it's been, you know, kind of like smoothed over by weather and things like that. It's an entirely different thing to grab rocks that are sharp. And why is it different? Because when you put your body weight on those rocks, what do you think happens to your fingers? What do you think happens to your feet? Those rocks cut into it. And when you look at this imposing rock wall, you're less likely to scale it because of the sharpness of the rocks. And the Bible is painting this picture that not only the Philistines fortified up in their mountain stronghold, 
But to get to that mountain stronghold, there are sharp rocks on either side. There were obstacles in the way of Jonathan accomplishing his purpose. But it didn't deter him. He didn't focus on the rocks. He didn't focus on the fortified positions. He didn't focus on the fact that the Philistines outnumbered him. He focused on the God that was able to deliver his enemy into his hand. Jesus faced obstacles while he walked this earth. He had to go head to head in battle with the devil. And then he had to put up with the frustration of the disciples constantly bickering and fighting amongst themselves. And then he had to fight the religious leaders of the time. And as he's fighting them, he had to support them and the church of the time. And while all the time going through these obstacles for you and me, he met the final ultimate obstacle in death. And when Jesus hung on that cross and the devil finally thought he had a great victory, it finally occurred to the devil that he wasn't witnessing the death of Christ. He was witnessing the life of you and me. When Jesus met that obstacle, the death, the grave, he rose himself from it and he said, Satan, you can put no obstacle in my path to deter me from my purpose. I have come to save humankind and I'm going to accomplish that task no matter what it takes. It doesn't matter what obstacles you face in your life. God's arm is not shortened that he cannot save. He will remove those obstacles out of the way and put you on the right path into everlasting kingdom with him if you will but focus on the mighty arm that saves. Quit looking at the obstacles. The sharp, rock, the sharp rock deters, but the mighty rock compels us to move forward. Now it's one thing, one thing to lead ourselves through extreme circumstances. It's an entirely different thing to lead someone else. And not only is it one thing to lead ourselves through trying circumstances and an entirely different thing to lead someone else through trying circumstances, but it's a completely other thing to be led through the trying circumstances. There are times in our lives where we're called to lead. There are times in our lives where we're called to let others lead and we got to follow. There's times in our lives where we have to take a supportive role. And in this passage, we get a good example. A faithful man who is willing to let someone else lead even if it costs him everything. Verse 6, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is within thy heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. This story has ever shown, has already shown us that Jonathan is not concerned about his military advantage. He's going to give up the element of surprise. He's going to climb sharp, rocky, fortified, stronghold positions. And he's going to go fight an army that greatly outnumbers him. And if you're the armor bearer and you're hearing this plan, what is going on in your mind? Because I know what's going on in my mind reading it. <laughs> no. <laughs> now listen. Listen. I really appreciate you. You're a good leader, Elder Mitchiff. But come on, why don't we have another committee and vote on this one? 
this one seems a little nuts to me. You're telling me that you're going to climb that rock and fight them. Okay, that's great. But you want me to do that too? <laughs> Wait a minute. So funny. Sharon and I were studying this passage. And we were going over this together and we were going for a walk and she was like, man, you can learn a lot of lessons from that armor bearer. I'm like, oh yeah, what's that? That men are nuts. She said, sometimes a wife's got to look at her husband and scratch her head. What in the world is going on? But this man, he looks back at Jonathan and he says, I see you got some crazy in you. He's like, that's all right. There's a little crazy in my family too. I caught a couple of jeans. Let's go do this. When you're called to take your supporting role in life, are you willing to die for that leader? Are you willing to give up your dreams and aspirations if need be? Are you willing to lay your plans aside? Are you willing to go through unneeded stress at times, anxiety, trials? And while you're going through those, are you still willing to support your leader? Why is I'm talking to you right now? The Bible's clear. There is a spiritual priest in the home, and God has given that role to the man. I ain't saying it's fair. I don't understand everything that God does. But it's clear that as we read the Bible, that's his plan. Are we supporting our husbands? Although it looks like they're leading us to certain failure. Now, I'm not talking about a blind, a blind allegiance. I'm not talking about letting go of all reason and common sense. But as you challenge their thinking and you go back and you pray about it and God says, I know this one's going to be tough for you, but I need you to walk this way anyways. Are you following the example of this armor bearer? Are you saying all that's in your heart to do, go do? Men, do you understand the responsibility that God has given you? Because let me tell you something. When you're right, when your wives are crying to God in their prayers and wondering what in the world is going on, you know who God's going to hold accountable, don't you? You know if he's telling your wife to support you, who he's going to come back to next. And just so we're clear on one more thing. Ephesians 5 says to submit one to another. We are not to lord it over our wives. There may be a time when we need to be the supportive role. What if she needs help? What if she can't do the regular duties that she usually does? Are you willing to sacrifice your time? Are you willing to sacrifice your money for things that you would rather have to support her and give her what she needs? Are you willing to die for her? Because that's what God's asking. In the church, you appoint leaders and you say, we want you to lead us. We want you to set the standard. Are you willing to support your leaders? That doesn't mean you shouldn't challenge your leaders. doesn't mean you shouldn't speak up if they're making mistakes. But are you willing to support them? Are you willing to hear them out? Are you willing to listen to them? Because that's what God's asking us. You know, it's interesting. The armor bearer, I had to look this up. I didn't know what that position was. It's basically an apprentice, an esquire, if you will. 
He was training on how to be a warrior for himself. He was mentoring underneath Jonathan. His job was not only to equip Jonathan to do his work, but to help him accomplish it. Jesus spends his entire life equipping us to accomplish the purposes that he wants us to accomplish. We have a forever friend that says, I'm going to walk by your side forever and I'm going to equip you in every situation you find yourself in. I'm going to give you the faith that you need. I'm going to give you the strength that you need. I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the ability. I am going to give you what you need to accomplish your purpose. Are you willing to walk with me and let me do that? Are you willing to keep moving forward? Because Jesus devotes himself to you and says, I'll die for you if I need to. I'd have to think that sometimes, sometimes Jesus thinks we're nuts. Sometimes we do things and Jesus must sit up there and scratch his head and wonder, what in the world are you thinking? And then like a good leader, he tells us that. He says, what are you thinking? But we don't always, we're not always quick to come off our position, are we? Sometimes we look back at Jesus, I don't know, but I'm going to do it. And he says, okay. I'm telling you right now, you shouldn't. I'm telling you right now, it's not going to end good for you. But I want you to know that I'm not leaving my position as your armor bearer. I might not walk with you in this journey, but as soon as you turn back, I'm going to be right there walking with you. God puts armor bearers in our lives for a reason. We need their support. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, David is recounting his life and he goes through 37 mighty men of valor. Mighty men that he could call on that in a given mode of notice would give their lives to him. No matter what the odds are, they were going to rush into that battle and die for him if need be. God has put people in our lives that will support us no matter what. We need to take care of those people. We need to lean on those people. We need to walk with those people. We need to listen to those people. God's given us armor bearers, just like he gave Jonathan. And he says, I'm expecting you to lead, and we're going to see something here in a minute before we end this sermon. Highlights this point a little bit more. Jonathan was asked to do something here. No doubt that the Holy Spirit was moving in him. And sometimes God's asked us to do crazy things. You know what I'm talking about? God ever asked you to do something crazy? All right. If God hasn't asked you to do nothing crazy, then you need, to, you need to step out a little bit. All right? Because I can read the Bible and God's like, hey, Gideon, I want you to dump all your men and take 300 against that army. That's a little nuts. You know what I'm saying? Then he's talking in 2 Chronicles 20. He's saying, listen... I don't want you to put the soldiers on the front lines. I want you to put the choir on the front lines because that sparks fear in every army. Well, it might if I was singing. And then he tells Jonathan, hey, climb this strong rock hold and go up there and fight a number that greatly outnumbers you and take them out. And in my life, many times, he's been like, Jay, you need to quit your job and go to school when you have a family. Are you nuts? Sometimes God asks us to do some pretty crazy things, doesn't he? But he asks us because he has the power to deliver us through it. He has the power to get us through what he's asking us to do. Jonathan, as he's talking to his armor bearer, he says, listen, the Lord is able to save by few as well as by many. And what was he doing? He was quoting a verse in Deuteronomy 28, verse 7. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The reason why 
Jonathan had the faith to go up there is because he knew that God was going to get him through this because God had already promised to give them victory over their enemies. And the reason why the armor bearer is willing to march with Jonathan up this hill is because he knows that Jonathan is following the Lord. Now, I want you to hang on that thought because we're going to come back to that too in a minute. And let's look at verses 8 through 13. 8 through 13. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. And if they say unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say to us, Come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. And both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth from out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after them. This is what I find interesting about this. Jonathan knows that he needs to go fight these Philistines. He knows that God's calling him into this battle. And he's even got the courage to ask somebody go with him and says, look, we're going to go up here and we're going to fight them. But he has no clue how that's going to happen. He has no clue. He knows he needs to go fight, but he doesn't know how to fight. So he says, God, what am I supposed to do? But Jonathan knew something. Jonathan had learned that, number one, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and will be giving him. And number two, Jonathan knew the next part of that verse. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Jonathan knew that not fighting was not an option. Jonathan said, Jonathan said, God's called us here. He's called us into this fight. And so he looks at his armor bearer and he says, this is the sign that we know that God is leading us. If he says, we'll call out, we'll, we'll show them where we're at. And if they say, stay here, then we'll fight defensively. But if they say, come up, then we'll go up there and fight. But the option was never not to fight. Because Jonathan knew that God had called him there. He was not wavering in his mind. He just didn't know the proper method of the battle. But he trusted that God would give him wisdom. Church family, it is not a question in this church whether we should go out and witness for Jesus. There's not a question in this church whether we should go to war with the devil. There's not a question whether we should tell people about Jesus or give them Bible studies and glow tracks and books. That's not a question. Have you read Matthew 28? Jesus said, go into all the world and tell them and teach them of me, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. He didn't give us an option. He said, go. Just like Jonathan We need to go. We may not know how to, but we need to go, and God will show us. When Jonathan said, this will be the sign, he didn't say, we're not going to fight. He said, I'll know how to fight based on what they tell me. I'm either going to go fight offensively because they want me to come up there, or I'm going to be defensive in my fighting position. Brothers and sisters, If you need to know what God's will is, ask him. Ask him. But we need to ask like Jonathan. Jonathan knew that he was going to war. He knew that. So he asked him, how do you want me to do it, God? He didn't say, do you want me to go or not to go? Because he already knew that answer. We can't be wavering when we're asking God for wisdom. Our heart has to be fully in it. God has told us the direction to go. He doesn't ask us to get divorces. If you're asking God whether or not you should get a divorce, I got to tell you, he's not going to give you that answer because he already gave it to you. He said, don't do it. Your question should be not whether I should get a divorce. Your question should be, Lord, how do you want me to restore this marriage? What do I need to do? 
That should be the question. How do I fight the devil out of my marriage? If you're questioning, <laughs> how do I raise my kids? Well, it's not, it's not to set them in front of a TV and let the TV do it. God said, teach them my ways. The question shouldn't be whether I should do worship with my kids. The question shouldn't be whether I should teach my kids God's ways. The question should be, Lord, how do I keep their attention while I'm teaching them your ways? Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to pose this question like Jonathan, because God doesn't give us a choice in many things. But he says, there's a method that will work, and you can ask me for that method, and I'll give it to you. The last point I want to make in this passage is in verse 24. I want to skip down verse 24. Last point I want to make in this passage. Verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. Sometime before or during the battle, Saul bound the people under an oath. This was the first of four oaths uttered on that day. The first three would show Saul's lack of compassion and selfish pride as the new king of Israel. The last, last oath spoken by the leaders of the army would redeem Saul's son Jonathan from death. Saul made a rash oath. Not only did Saul make a rash oath, but he shows us by his own words that this is false zeal. He wasn't doing this in the interest of God's kingdom. He wasn't making this oath in the interest of moving God's mission forward. He made this oath in the interest of making his kingdom look better. In verse 24, I want to read it again. And the men of Israel distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening. And why does he say that? That I may be avenged on my enemies. What was his purpose? He wanted to look good in front of everybody in Israel. He wanted to look strong to the Philistine enemies. He was trying to preserve that which the Lord had already taken from him by selfish purposes, and so he set up a false, pious disposition to prey upon the, the love and the respect of the Israelites' love for God to get them to accomplish his purpose to make him look good. Saul was turning aside from God, and yet now he's making pious oaths, building altars, being most zealous for the form of godliness, godliness when he was denying the power of it. Now, it's really interesting. Saul was denying God this entire time, but acting like he was following God. But look at verse 45. Look at verse 45. Verse 45. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he hath wrought with God this day, so the people rescued Jonathan that he died not. And that word should be redeemed and not rescued. My point is this. The people and the armor bearer were willing to follow Jonathan into death. Why? Because he was in harmony with God's will. He had a living connection to God, and he is living out a real faith in Jesus Christ. But Saul had set up some pious form of religion, a false zeal, and the people saw right through it. They refused to follow him and do his will because he wasn't following God. Now, I want to come back to this, husbands, because I made it pretty hard on ladies earlier. If you have to ask your wives to follow you, 
You've missed it. You've missed it. Because if they sensed that you were doing God's will, they would already be in the fight. Leaders, if we have to demand the church listen to us, we've lost it. Because if they sensed that we were doing God's will, they'd already be right there with us. People follow the Lord. No matter what I do, no matter how good of a sermon I preach, no matter how good of a person I am, no matter how many times I help you guys, you will never follow me. You will follow Jesus Christ. And you should follow Jesus Christ. Now there will be times when he may use me to lead you. And if I'm doing the Lord's will, you will follow me. And you know how I'll know? Because when I look around me, I'll see you there. But if I get to the direction I think we need to be in, and I look back and none of you are there with me, then guess what? I wasn't doing God's will. We must be following the Lord. We must be fully consecrated. If this passage shows us nothing, it's that men and women are willing to die for you when you're doing God's will. But when you're not doing the Lord's will, they will oppose you at every step of the way. I was sitting in this, this church setting. I don't want to give too many details. Sitting in this church setting, and there was this person teaching Sabbath school, this man teaching Sabbath school. And as they were teaching this class, I was very well acquainted with all their shenanigans, everything that they were doing behind the scenes before they got up that day and were teaching this class. And they were teaching something in the Bible, and the only thing that was in my mind was, guess what? Everything that person did. I'm like, what a hypocrite. I can't believe that you're up here right now. And I was like, God, I don't even know if they're preaching truth because I'm so distracted. I don't even care what they're teaching because all I know is everything they've done wrong. And you know what God said to me? It blew my mind. He said, Jay, how do you think your wife feels about you? I don't want to ask her. Certainly not in front of you guys. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you this. I'm here to tell you this. If you're called to lead, you better get in harmony with Jesus Christ. Order your life after him. And people will respect that. Husbands, your wife has been given a sacred calling. She has been called to follow you and to support you, even when you're doing stupid stuff. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not following God, you're going to get to a point in your relationship where she's not going to be there. Women, wives, if you know your husband's following God and doing the best that he can to do that, even if he's making mistakes, you need to let that go. And you need to support him. We need more armor bearers out there. We need more Jonathans out there. We need more people that can discern when someone's following God and not. But what we don't need is any more King Saul's. There's enough pride running around this world. That needs to die. What's your role in life today? What season of life are you in? A leader, a follower? Have you backslidden? Maybe you've fallen out of harmony with God, but you want to get back there. Wherever you're at today, Jesus is calling you back. And he's saying, I haven't given up on you. I still have a mission for you. 
And if you surrender to me, you will accomplish your role that I've called you to with great distinction. Who's in? Who's in? Amen. Our closing hymn, number 526.